Bible says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him and shall sit upon the throne of his glory. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, all those on the earth will see Christ coming, like the Bible says, in his glory. And that is going to be the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not going to be the rapture. We're going to talk about a little bit about, about that throughout the message. But that's what we have in Matthew chapter number 25, the second coming. It's not the rapture of the church that we're reading about. It's his second coming. They're two distinct things. Look at Revelation chapter number one. Revelation chapter number one and verse number seven. Revelation one seven. Behold, he cometh with clouds. The Bible says in Matthew 24, see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. And they come through the clouds on his second coming. And then every eye shall see him. He comes, you got, you know, you can't see, if you look up in, into, into the uh, first heaven and, and uh, you know, you can see the birds and all that, but then you keep looking up and you see clouds and you can't see above the clouds. Now, if you get in an airplane and you take a flight out of Nashville, and once they get you past the clouds, well, now you can see above them. But we're going to see in a little bit, the clouds do serve as a, a shield. You can't see past it. So when Christ comes, he's going to be coming. He's going to be coming from uh, the third heaven. He's going to come down to second heaven and past the clouds. And, come. and then every eye shall see him. You know when that's going to happen? At his second coming. Every eye shall see him, verse number seven, Revelation one. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. A couple of thoughts that we're going to look at tonight concerning the Lord's second coming. And we're going to draw some distinctions between that and the rapture as we go through some of these verses. But I'd like us to do a little study on the connection between glory and brightness. So if you would, let's go back to the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. We're going to build off Matthew 25, 30, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. And we're going to make some connections with his glory right now and brightness. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse number 19. Watch what the prophet Isaiah says. The sun, Isaiah 60, verse 19. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. One reference here that connects or makes a connection between the Lord and his glory and brightness. Go over to Ezekiel. We'll flip forward a few books. Ezekiel chapter number one. We'll see what he has to say under the Holy Spirit's inspiring power. Ezekiel chapter number one and verse number 28. Ezekiel one twenty eight, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. Brightness round about. Likeness of the glory of the Lord. A few passages here looking at the connection between the glory, the Son of Man coming in his glory, and then his brightness. Every eye is going to see him at his second coming. Ezekiel 10. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse number 4. Ezekiel 10, 4. 
And the Bible says, then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And go over to Hebrews chapter one. The last one we'll look at. Make a few comments. Hebrews chapter number one. Hebrews chapter one. Verse one, Hebrews one, verse one, God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake a time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand. Of the majesty on high. Being the brightness of his glory. When the Lord comes back. Part of how his glory is going to be magnified. Is going to be because of his brightness. (laughs) And we can run more passages. But just a few of them. is Isaiah 60. Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. Hebrews 1. Connects the glory and the brightness of the Lord. And that's going to be part of how. His glory is going to be manifested. Let's go back to Isaiah and let's look at uh, something else. Let's connect glory and light. Look at Isaiah 58. And then get Luke 2. We'll stay in Isaiah 58. and Let's get Luke 2. Isaiah 58, Luke 2. Isaiah 58, verse number 8. Then shall light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. And here it is. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. That's pretty good. The light shall break forth. And that's the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is connected to light. It's connected to brightness. Go back uh, forward. Isaiah 60. Look at the first verse. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The 19th verse in Isaiah 60. This, uh, we, let's see. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither... For brightness, we looked at that, shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light. We see the same thing, an everlasting light. We see brightness connected to the glory of God, glory of the Lord. Last one on this one is Luke chapter 2, verse number 32. Luke 2, 32. It says, a light to lighten the Gentiles. And the glory of thy people, Israel. The Lord, when he came, when he came for his first coming, when he was in that manger, he came for a specific reason, to die for the sins of the world. His second coming isn't going to be like that at all. It's going to be for his glory to be seen by everyone. And we're going to see the glory. We're going to see the brightness. We're going to see the light. He's already taken care of sin, but it's almost like, you know how people say, well, (laughs) why you, you try to witness to somebody and I'm sure it's happening tonight. Why does God let, Little babies die. Why does God let people starve to death? Why does God let all of these wars break out? Everybody wants the solution that's going to be coming at the Lord's second coming, but they don't want to deal with the the solution that he provided for his first coming. (laughs) Okay? All of the stuff that we don't like that's happening down here, it's it's, it's the result of the curse of the fall. It's, It's our sin. Christ took care of that when he came the first time and he died on the cross. And all 
that other stuff that everybody wants when he comes back a second time and sets up a righteous, when he sets up his millennial kingdom and he's going to rule righteously, there's not going to be. And people so often put the cart before the horse. They want all the stuff that's coming at the second coming. And they fail to realize or they fail to deal with the reason why Christ came the first time. So, other thing that let's look at is we're going to uh, 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 connect this some scripture here with the Lord and then clouds. We looked at brightness, we looked at light, and now let's look at clouds in relation to uh, the 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 second coming and then the rapture, and we'll make some distinctions. So go back to Psalms. And look at Psalm 104. Psalm 104. And also go back one book to the uh, to Job. And get your finger in Job 22. So we can get there and then. We got Psalm 104, keep your finger in Job 22. The Bible says in Psalm 104, verse number two, who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. That's somebody worth living for. The creator who just stretched it out like a curtain. All you ladies that make like to make things look pretty and you put curtains up and you get the perfect little thing that it goes on there and you just go like that and it just whew, opens up just so right. God did that. Except he did it with <laughs> a much more magnificent way stretching out the heavens. Verse 3, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. What I wanted you to take a look at is just doing a Bible study on some verses here, but the, the, the clouds are his chariot. That's pretty cool. That's the Lord who stretched out the heaven and the clouds are his chariot. Look what else it says in Psalm 18. Keep your finger in Job 22. We'll continue to work our way toward that. But let's take a stop in Psalm 18. Clouds of the Lord's chariot. And look at Psalm 18. The Bible says in verse number 11. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters. And here it is, thick clouds of the sky. Now we'll read Job 22 and then I'll make a couple of comments on that. Job 22, look at verse number 12. So in Psalm 18, we see thick clouds. Psalm 20, uh, Job 22 and verse number 12, the Bible says, Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. And thou sayest, how doth God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? Thick clouds, there it is again, are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. Those thick clouds that are up there that God created that he stretched out serve as a covering. It serves as a hiding, if you will, where we can't, there's only so far our eye can see. The clouds block. Our view. They're the Lord's chariot. They serve as a covering. And go to First Thessalonians chapter number four. First Thessalonians chapter number four. Y'all know this verse. Last, well, second to last verse. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse seventeen. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. 
Now, you know why this is interesting to me and what we're trying to get to tonight is when we looked at Revelation chapter one and we looked at um, Matthew 25, verse 31. And we connected those verses, the Lord at his second coming. Who is going to see him? Every eye is going to see him, right? The brightness, the glory, the light. He's going to come. He's going to hit the clouds. He's going to come through the clouds. And boom, there it is. The Lord of glory and his light and his brightness. And every eye shall see him. That's not going to be so at the rapture. Clouds are his chariot. Clouds we see as a, a thick cloud as a, as a covering. That is not going to be the case. If we were to get raptured right now, the whole world isn't going to see. Every eye is not going to see him. There's going to be a meeting in the air, and then life is kind of going to go on like it always has. In some, in some ways, I mean, it's we know it's going to get worse, but in the sense of, you know, how many Christians there really are statistically. Well, Uncle Joe's gone. Wonder where he went. <laughs> and then everybody's back to doing the same old wicked stuff they've been doing. Look, it, it, it's going to have an effect on the earth. But it isn't going to be that much of an effect. It's a coming down now. Uh, it's not going to have that much effect. Now, we lost a lot of people over the last couple of years. And you know what happens? Life goes on. I don't know how many true, born-again, Bible-believing Christians there are right now in this, living on this world, uh, living on this earth, in this world. But if the rapture were to happen tonight, statistically, there ain't going to be that many people going up. <laughs> or just this. How many people do you talk to and say, yeah, I'm a Christian? What does that mean? And they'll give you some reason that has absolutely nothing to do with what the Bible says about how you would become a Christian. Were you ever born again? What does that mean? Those clouds are going to serve as a covering. When, we, when the church gets raptured, every eye is not going to see him. Matthew 25. Keep your finger in 1 Thessalonians 4, though. Look at something else. Keep your finger in Matthew 25. 25. I like when the, you know, the kids go, more of the teenagers, I would say, too, not the young ones, because it'll freak mom out too much, but you know, these teenagers, that they dress up in these horrifying, like, death costumes. And you give them a gospel track and they say, I'm a Christian. Why are you dressed up like death then? I thought you have eternal life. Like, why are you have blood and guts and other stuff that we don't even need to talk about? But it's out there. If you're a Christian, why are you so attracted to that type of thing. I don't get it, but that's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with. Matthew 25, verse 31. The Bible says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Now watch First Thessalonians chapter number four. Look at the 16th verse. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. In Matthew 25, what is proceeding? Look at verse, uh, well, let, 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 let me hold that thought. Let me hold that thought for a second. In Matthew 25, who's with him? All what? The holy angels. That's Matthew 25, verse 31. You see it? Right in the middle of the verse. And all. The holy angels. First Thessalonians 4, what's happening? For the Lord himself. Guess who he's coming with? 
himself. <laughs> now there's the voice of the archangel. But you have a distinction there between the Lord's second coming and between the rapture of the church. In his second coming, all the holy angels with him. At the rapture, it's only going to be a stop in the air, and then it's up. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now, let's finish the thought that I started to say, and I got my... Let's get back on track here. Matthew 24, verse 30. Go back a chapter. Keep your finger in 1 Thessalonians 4. Matthew 24, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other what precedes the lord's what precedes the lord coming back for his second coming the sending forth of his angels that is what precedes and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they, now they have a job to do. Gather together his elect. We talked about all this before. We're not going to do a deep dive from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. In, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, watch what it says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel. There's a voice. Of the archangel we did a whole lesson on, on on michael the archangel we're not going to go into that again and with the trump of god and the dead in christ shall rise first angels aren't preceding him the bible says there's the voice of the archangel what's all involved in that i don't know but i know there's the voice of the archangel and i know the archangel is michael as the bible says watch Verse 17, then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Clouds and air, where is the meeting when the church gets raptured? Clouds in the air. Second coming, where is the meeting? Earth. He's coming down past the clouds. Everybody, every eye is going to see him. And it's going to be on the earth. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3, the last verse, because we talked about glory, but I want to, you want to see one more thing, one more thing. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse number 13, the Bible says, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all his saints. Now it says here. Hearts established. Unblameable before who? Before God. Who's what? Even our, even the father. So when it says. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all his saints. The coming where? Well we know it's before God. Because it says. In holiness before God. Even our father. Well, where's the throne of God? Is it on earth? It's not. The throne of God is in heaven. Hebrews 1, Hebrews 8, and Hebrews 13. Three, three places in Hebrews we can go to. Where's Christ coming for his second coming? On earth. Where's the throne of God? In heaven. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13, if we're going to, in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, where is that going to be? It's going to be in glory, in heaven, before God, the Father. Coloss get Colossians 3. And we'll see glory as a location. 
Colossians chapter number three. And get first Timothy chapter number three. Colossians chapter three. Keep your finger in first Thessalonians. Go past that and, and you'll come to first Timothy three. Yeah, we go through these quickly. Watch Colossians three. We'll do that one first. Colossians three, if verse one, ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Is that you, by the way? We should set our affection above uh, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. God's throne is in the third heaven. God the Father is on the throne. Where is Jesus Christ? At the right hand. Set your affections on things above. We already said that, not on things in the earth. For ye are dead, your life is hid with Christ and God. Verse 4 When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And the context here in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, glory is considered a location. A location. It's not a reference to our glorified bodies, although we will get them. 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. Show you it again. You all know this verse. Without controversy, grace, the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Uh, you want to look at your Bible and make sure you have the word God there. Some of the modern versions will take God out. And they'll just put he. Well, I'm manifest in the flesh. You're manifest in the flesh. That's really not a great mystery. <laughs> But when God is, now without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory as a location. As a location. So that brings us right back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll look at that last verse. 1 Thessalonians 3, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. That means we are going to be coming with the Lord to glory, a location, before God the Father. And you know how that's going to happen. Dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive remain be caught up. We meet the Lord where? In the air. Every eye is not going to see him at the rapture. <laughs> and then we are going to go up. And then we are going to have. Uh, uh, well, I, I lost the verse Thessalonians 3.13. But then we're going to have our hearts established unblameable before God. In glory. In glory. So rapture, church is caught up. It's the catching away of the saints. The clouds are the covering of God, the chariot of God. Every eye is not going to see him. They're not going to see his brightness. They're not going to see his light. They're just going to know that you're gone. <laughs> and then they're going to move on because they really don't care so much about you anyway. <laughs> Why do you got to talk about Jesus? And why do you got to ask me if I'm saved? And why do you got to, you know how it goes. In many ways, they'll be glad we're gone. Except, not really. And how lifted up his eyes in torments. So what do we do now? The light of the world is Jesus. And we shine that light into a dark world. How? His word. His gospel. His truth. Their heart's dark. You think they get saved and all of a sudden they walk around like a glow stick? <laughs> it isn't a physical light that anybody's going to see. 
when he comes back a second time, though, it's going to be a physical light that everyone's going to see. So 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13, uh, one last thought, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Go to Matthew 25 again. Matthew 25, because we talked about these judgments at the, the last uh, subsection of Matthew 25. And we have two different judgments. First Thessalonians 3.13, may set charts blameable before God in holiness um, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Our judgment is not the judgment in Matthew 25. Our judgment will be when we're caught up and then we're going to go to uh, with the Lord. And we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's a judgment for saved people. We went through all those verses uh, last time. Uh, First Corinthians uh, 3 or 2 Corinthians 5. Tie those two chapters together and you're going to get. If you're saved. You're going to be judged. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be based on your works. Your works don't save you. Your soul's already in heaven. There's no reason for you or I to fear losing our salvation. There's absolutely nothing at all to do with that. We're saved. Our soul's saved. The Lord's got rewards. And the judgment seat of Christ will be where those rewards are rendered. That's the judge. If you're saved, that's your judgment. That's my judgment. Has absolutely nothing at all to do with our soul or our salvation. But if you were to work your whole life to become number one in baseball or number one in football or number one in violin or number one in sales or number one in, you know, making the million dollar mark on the real estate market every year and getting the plaque from YouTube because you had a million views and all that. If you were going to work that hard for all of that here on earth for our own glory, why don't we put that same effort into something that would have eternal glory? Amen. Does that make, does that make sense? Amen. Now, that's not a statement or that's not a Bible verse to not provide for your family and do all that stuff because those are also things the Lord asks us to do. I did more as men, but uh, that's the judgment for us. The Matthew 25 judgment, it isn't going to happen in heaven and it isn't for saved people. It's a national judgment. And that national judgment, Matthew 25, so we're going to be before God in heaven we're going to come up with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to be before God. We talked about that judgment. Matthew 25, last verse we'll look at, verse 32. The Bible says, and before him, see that? Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And where did we say again, talk back to me now, where did we say again the judgment seat of Christ will be? In heaven, in heaven. Matthew 25, verse 32, this national judgment, Son of man shall come in glory with all the holy angels of him, and shall sit upon the throne of glory before him, shall be gathered all the nations. Where is that national judgment going to take place? On earth. Right here on earth. Two different ideas with angels. Two different ideas with judgments, two different locations with judgments. They're not the same thing. The rapture and the second coming are not the same thing. Before him shall be gathered all nations. And how are they going to be judged? Remember we said we're going to be judged based on our works. Did it have eternal reward or did it have eternal value? There'll be a reward for that. Was it just done? Just it was good, but it wasn't really anything to do with the Lord. It's going to just be burned up. No. Based on, based on our works as Christians. This national judgment, what's going to be the basis for the judgment? Verse number 40. Look at verse 40 and we'll get it. And the king shall answer. 
and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. It's going to be a national judgment on earth, and it will be based on how they treated the least of these my brethren, the Jews. And all of the national leaders, talked about this last week, so we won't rehash it, but all the national leaders that are able to make decisions will be judged by God. And if they didn't help out the Jews, and all the stuff they were told to do, they didn't do. They're going to be cast into everlasting fire. So the stuff that we see happening right now, these national uh, entities that are anti-Semitic or these national entities that are against Israel. And these national entities, these leaders that we have to be under. Because it's coming to the United States as well. It's already here, some would say. To what degree, how hot it will wax, I don't know. But we individually don't have a set. Church gets raptured out of here. You think those national leaders are going to change their mind about God? If I got to sit down with a politician, or a leader, I've never sat down with a national leader. But if I ever had the opportunity, as respectful as I could be, sir, we need to talk about where your soul is going to go when you die. But don't you think you should talk to him about policy? No. He's not going to listen to me. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm going to give him the glorious light of Lord Jesus Christ. And if his soul gets saved, truly born again, he will govern differently. And you as an individual, me as an individual, when we got saved, now our life is, our individual life is governed differently. We don't go where we used to go. We don't talk the way we used to talk. We don't do the things we used to do. And that is the solution right now for us is we're in the business of trying to get the glory of God, the glorious gospel of grace and the light of Jesus Christ into the hearts and mind and, and so a soul can be born again. John 12, 46, so we'll leave you with this. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Who can be saved? Who? The Bible says, whosoever believeth. Well, I just don't know if they would, or I don't know if they wouldn't. So, whosoever believeth. It's not you or I to sort that out. It's for you and I to sow the seed, the word of God, and whosoever believeth. Can I say, well, can I be saved? I've done all the, whosoever believeth, whosoever believeth.